the fibula will likely prove to be the best donor site for mandible reconstruction over the long run. It has a number of important advantages compared to other free flap alternatives. First, the bone is long enough to reconstruct any length mandible defect. Second, the perineal artery courses parallel to the fibula, providing a rich segmental blood supply all along its length. This means that osteotomies can be made frequently and wherever necessary in order to accurately reproduce mandible shape. The fibula can be raised with a skin island large enough to replace any internal or external soft tissue defect. Muscle can also be included in the flap. The muscle is completely separate from the skin component and is ideal for soft tissue replacement in the submandibular and submental area. The fibula is at an optimal distance from the head and neck area to facilitate a two-team approach. And finally, the morbidity associated with the use of the fibula is minor and well tolerated. A clinical case will now be presented to illustrate the use of the fibula for mandible reconstruction. This 15-year-old patient has an osteogenic sarcoma of the body of the right mandible with minimal intraoral soft tissue involvement. The bony resection will extend from the symphysis to just beyond the angle. Mandible reconstruction will be performed primarily using a fibula osteocutaneous free flap. Two key x-ray studies are obtained. First is the lateral cephalogram. An acrylic template is made based on the pattern outlined. The other study is a one-to-one -one scale CT scan from which a second acrylic template is made. This template provides accurate information on the curve of the mandible in the transverse plane. The templates made from the x-ray studies are shown. Two sets are usually made. Graph shape is determined almost exclusively by these templates with the aid of a few key measurements taken directly from the surgical specimen. Resection of the mandible is performed while the fibula is raised by a second team. Minimal involvement is seen in the gingiva, just below the right lower lateral incisor and adjacent canine. Arch bars are used to maintain occlusion during final fitting of the graft. The angle of the mandible and the neck incision are shown. Whenever possible, the incision is confined to the neck for the best aesthetic result. The flap is elevated with care taken not to injure the marginal mandibular nerve. Next, the mandible is exposed. Later in the dissection, the mandible is split with a sagittal saw and the muscles in the submental area divided. Next, the bone is divided just above the angle of the mandible. After the remaining soft tissue attachments are divided, the specimen is removed. The specimen is kept available for use both as a visual guide to assist in shaping the graft and as an accurate reference by which the total length of the graft can be precisely determined. The bony defect extends from the symphysis to the distal ramus, just above the angle of the mandible. There is an associated soft tissue defect in the floor of the mouth and submental area. Removal of several teeth medially and step cutting the mandible is an essential aid to achieving a reliable soft tissue closure at the point of juncture between the graft and mandible. The mandible is then placed in intermaxillary fixation with elastics. The level where the fibula will be transected proximally and distally is shown. perineal artery approaches the fibula in its proximal one-third and then parallels the course of the bone distally. It provides both a rich segmental periosteal as well as an endosteal blood supply. The axis of the skin island is parallel to the posterior border of the fibula. Notice that the skin island is not centered over the mid-axis of the bone.
the flexor hallucis longus muscle is an important part of the flap and a key landmark in its dissection. After the tourniquet is inflated, dissection begins by incising the anterior edge of the skin island. The incision is deepened and extended through the deep fascia. This exposes the muscles of the lateral compartment. The muscle is then separated from the intermuscular septum, which carries the blood supply from the fibula to the skin island. The electrocautery is then used to separate the lateral compartment musculature as a group from the fibula. The cuff of muscle left on the fibula is only several millimeters thick. This is adequate to preserve the periosteal blood supply to the bone. The skin island the intermuscular septum carrying its blood supply and the fibula are shown. Branches of the anterior tibial vessels can be seen as well as the intermuscular septum between the lateral and anterior muscle compartments. This intermuscular septum is then divided to expose the anterior compartment muscles. Care is taken proximally to prevent damage to the anterior tibial vessels. The intermuscular septum is then divided the length of the bone. The anterior compartment muscles are then removed from the fibula with the electrocautery. Again, very little muscle is left attached to the bone. The interosseous membrane between the fibula and tibia is exposed and is seen here as a bluish white structure. The skin island, intermuscular septum, and fibula are seen. The cut edge of the intermuscular septum between the lateral and anterior compartments is shown. The lateral compartment muscles, the anterior compartment muscles, and the interosseous membrane are now shown. The interosseous membrane is then divided the length of the bone. The tibialis posterior muscle is exposed just deep to it. Division of the interosseous membrane completes the flap dissection anteriorly. The next part of the dissection begins with the posterior incision of the skin island. The incision is deepened to expose the gastrocnemius and soleus muscles. A cleft is then developed between the soleus muscle and the structures deep to it. This exposes the flexor hallucis longus muscle, which lies against the fibula. The soleus is then detached from the fibula. Proximally, the perineal vessels are exposed as the last attachments of the soleus are divided. After additional dissection, the vessels are more clearly defined as they enter the undersurface of the flexor hallucis longus muscle. The fibula is then divided distally with the saw. Next, the bone is divided proximally.
prior to release of the tourniquet, the perineal artery and vein are divided distally. The remainder of the flap dissection is usually performed with the tourniquet released. The fascia of the flexor hallucis longus is incised along the length of the muscle. This allows the fibula to be more easily mobilized outward away from the leg. The divided ends of the distal perineal vessels are shown. The cut edges of the interosseous membrane are seen with the chevron pattern of the tibialis posterior muscle between them. Note the median raffe of the muscle. The tibialis posterior muscle is then divided along this median raffe. This raffe is reliably located between the perineal vessels and the posterior tibial vessels. It represents a safe line in which the muscle can be divided without injury to either of these critical vascular bundles. The flexor hallucis longus muscle is then divided at the level of the distal osteotomy. After this maneuver, the fibula is more easily retracted outward from the leg. The distal cut end of the flexor hallucis longus muscle is shown. Then the proximal end. Then the cut edge of the tibialis posterior muscle. As the tibialis posterior muscle is retracted, the posterior tibial vessels and the tibial nerve are seen underneath. The tibialis posterior muscle is then divided in a proximal direction along the median raffe. The remaining portion of the muscle is divided very carefully after a plane is created between the muscle and the perineal vessels which lie just deep to it. These vessels cross from medial to lateral in this area. They are seen as they enter the flexor hallucis longus muscle underneath as the graft is lifted upward. After the muscle is completely divided, the vascular pedicle is carefully dissected under loop magnification. The dissection proceeds from both posteriorly and anteriorly. The donor site anatomy is reviewed. The skin island is shown. The intramuscular septum carrying the blood supply to the skin is shown as a narrow segment between the skin and the bone. The lateral compartment muscles, the anterior compartment muscles, and the interosseous membrane are indicated. Deep to the septum is the tibialis posterior muscle. As the flap is retracted away from the leg, the soleus muscle is seen. As the tibialis posterior muscle is lifted, the posterior tibial vessels and the tibial nerve are shown. Proximally, the vascular pedicle to the flap is shown as it diverges away from the posterior tibial vessels. The perineal vein is seen in this close-up. It may be present as one or two trunks. 
the perineal artery is shown at its point of origin from the posterior tibial artery. This edge of the skin island shows excellent bleeding from the dermis following completed flap dissection. The template is used as an aid to determine where the first osteotomy should be made. The bone is completely transected with the sagittal saw. Great care is taken not to injure the soft tissue immediately behind the bone. A second osteotomy is made proximally to discard excess bone length. This portion of the bone, which will not be used, is removed by careful subperiosteal dissection. This preserves all soft tissue, which includes blood supply to the skin island. After most of the soft tissue is removed in this fashion, the remainder is cut off with a knife. The distal end of the graft exhibits excellent bleeding from the bone marrow. The shortened graft is shown. A second osteotomy is made to begin the process of curving the graft. A wedge is removed to establish the proper angle between the two segments of bone. The burr is then used to fine tune the angle of each bone end. After a precise fit is established, the angle that the segments make with one another is compared to the template. Mini plates are then placed to fix the bone segments to one another. The template is used as a reference to ensure that the proper shape of the graft is maintained during this process. Another osteotomy is made to increase the curve in the part of the graft that corresponds to the body of the mandible. The curve is checked with the transverse section template. The fit at this osteotomy site must also include an upward cant of the graft when seen from the side. The proper shape in this plane is confirmed with the lateral view template. After a mini plate is used to fix this site, the shape is again checked with the two templates. The partially shaped graft is shown here in relation to the vascular pedicle. In this patient, an additional osteotomy in the body is required to achieve accurate mandible shape. The remaining osteotomies and plate fixation will be performed at the recipient site. At this time, a 3,000 unit dose of heparin is administered. Ten minutes later, the pedicle is divided and the flap removed. In review, three osteotomies have been made in the graft. Two of these have been fixed with mini plates prior to division of the flap. A portion of the skin has been harvested with the flap to restore the missing intraoral lining. The flexor hallucis longus muscle will be used to replace missing soft tissue in the submental area. The vascular pedicle will come to lie at the angle of the mandible in close proximity to the recipient vessels. The flap is shown here compared to the specimen which was removed. The graft has been purposely left long on both ends so that final adjustments for length can be made at the recipient site. 
The location and angle of the osteotomy is determined with the aid of the template. Note the two scored lines in the template, which were determined by measurements taken from the surgical specimen. The site of the osteotomy and the degree of its angulation is then marked. The osteotomy is then made. The fit of the graft is checked after the osteotomy is complete. The fit of the graft is adjusted so that the curve of the graft matches that of the template. A mini plate is then placed to secure the graft in place. The template is again used to ensure the proper angle between the graft and the mandible. A second mini plate is then placed along the lower border of the mandible to securely anchor the graft. The mini plate screws are then tightened after both plates are in place. Attention is then turned to the opposite end of the graft. The top of the lateral view template is trimmed since remaining masseter muscle attachments do not otherwise allow it to be placed next to the mandible. Additional trimming of the superior portion of the template is sometimes necessary. The most important portion of the template is the contour that corresponds to the inferior border of the mandible. The overall length of the graft is checked with a ruler and compared to the measurement taken from the surgical specimen. The location of the last osteotomy is determined and then the bone cut. The last extra piece of bone is excised. A small amount of soft tissue is excised proximally to facilitate graft fit. The fit of the graft is then checked and a mini plate applied. Accurate shape of the mandible is confirmed with the template before additional mini plates are applied. When the shape is correct, additional mini plates are placed to provide complete fixation.
final check on mandible contour is performed using both the lateral and the transverse templates. Graft shaping and final insetting is now complete. The skin island will be rotated over the mandible reconstruction and be incorporated into the intraoral closure. The flexor hallucis longus muscle will be used to fill in the dead space in the submental area. The vascular pedicle is shown underneath this muscle. It lies in close proximity to the recipient vessels. The final portion of the procedure will consist of the microvascular anastomoses and wound closure. The perineal artery is usually anastomosed to the facial artery in end-to-end -end fashion. The second most commonly used recipient vessel is the external carotid artery end-to-side. An interrupted technique using 9 nylon suture is usually used. The sutures are generally all pre-placed on one side of the vessel before they're tied. The perineal vein is usually quite large. Anastomosis is performed to a branch of the internal jugular vein or the external jugular vein in end-to-end -end fashion. Occasionally, the perineal vein will be anastomosed to the internal jugular vein and to side. A continuous technique using 9 nylon suture is usually used. completed arterial anastomosis is shown after release of the clamps. The venous anastomosis is also shown a short distance away. The skin edge shows excellent bleeding following restoration of flap circulation. Note the quality of the bleeding despite multiple graft osteotomies and mini plate fixation. Excess flexor hallucis longus muscle is trimmed so that the right amount remains for soft tissue closure in the submental area. The flexor hallucis longus muscle is then sutured to the muscles in the area. Muscle closure in the submental area is now complete.
The excess portion of the skin island is carefully deepithelialized. It is important to retain almost the entire length of the skin island in order to ensure adequate blood supply. The skin island is then tucked into the oral cavity. All that remains is closure of the neck wound and the intraoral wound. The neck wound is closed in layers in standard fashion. A drain is placed deep to the neck flaps. After the skin closure is completed, the head is repositioned and the oral closure meticulously performed with interrupted mattress sutures. The donor site wound can be closed primarily when a skin island no more than four centimeters wide is used. The leg is placed in a posterior splint for five days and then ambulation is begun. The preoperative panorex is seen above and the postoperative study below. Note the excellent symmetry of the lower border of the mandible on the post-op view. This type of result can only be achieved by selecting a flap such as the fibula that can be safely osteotomized in multiple areas, by fabricating templates to assist in the graft shaping process, and by using mini plates to fix each osteotomy site securely. The intraoral skin island is shown. Much larger skin islands are necessary in other cases to resurface the lateral floor of the mouth and the undersurface of the tongue. There is no practical limit to the size of the skin island that can be included with the bone. Wide skin islands will require a skin graft to close the donor site, however. The patient is shown here six months following surgery. She has completed a course of radiotherapy and is undergoing chemotherapy at the time of these pictures. Most of the edema in the face and neck has resolved. The aesthetic result is enhanced by incisions that avoid splitting the lip. She has normal speech and is able to open her mouth without restriction. She has returned to her normal activities and reports no disability at the donor site. This completes the clinical presentation. In summary, the fibula is a superior donor site for mandible reconstruction. It provides ample, high-quality bone that is well suited to the task. The bone is easy to contour because of its shape and the multiple graft osteotomies required are safe to perform due to the nature of the fibula blood supply. There is abundant skin and muscle available with the bone to simultaneously reconstruct complex associated soft tissue defects. The donor site location is ideal. It is far enough from the head and neck area to facilitate a two-team approach to resection and reconstruction. Finally, this donor site is not associated with significant morbidity. In the previous video, a patient example was used to illustrate the technique of fibula free flap mandible reconstruction. The sequence of steps in the process was presented with a special emphasis made on donor site dissection. The technical nuances of graft shaping that are vital to achieving a high quality aesthetic result are the subject of this video. In addition, 
the technique of condyle transplantation will be shown, and several important donor site design concepts illustrated. Mandible defects are of two basic types, lateral and anterior. Each poses a different three-dimensional problem and requires a specific approach to shaping the graft. The two goals are to precisely duplicate the missing mandible segment and to inset it accurately. Both must be achieved in order to restore overall mandible shape and preserve the spatial relationships that determine facial aesthetics. The problem of the lateral defect will be presented first. The typical location of osteotomies needed for a lateral resection are shown. When the resection is at mid-ramus or higher, it is best to disarticulate the specimen and then to harvest the condyle from it. This is done because there is not enough exposure to plate the finished graft to a short in situ condyle segment. An acrylic template made from a lateral cephalogram tracing will be used to help shape the graft at the donor site. A transverse plane template is also used and is made from a full-size CT scan section. This is a model of the resected specimen. It is important to measure total posterior height before removing the condyle and to also measure the length of the body segment needed. After removing the condyle, the margin is proven free of disease by frozen section examination of bone scrapings. The osteotomies needed to harvest the graft are shown in black. Graft length is usually more than 20 centimeters. The pedicle is shown in relation to the harvested graft. The osteotomy to form the angle is done first. It is placed where the vessels enter the bone. The lateral template helps plan the slant of the cut. The bone is grasped in this fashion when cutting it. The vessels are pushed away from the approaching saw by the index and thumb. All osteotomies are made without removing periosteum. The template is used to plan the angle of the next osteotomy as shown. After the cuts, the correct angle is confirmed with the template. The angle is checked again after the first mini plate is placed. The bottom holes of the first plate are not used. A second plate is placed as shown. The ramus diverges from the body in a sagittal plane. The specimen provides a reference for setting this subtle angle. Total ramus height, measured from the specimen, will be restored by adding the condyle as a graft. Condyle graft length is measured and an osteotomy planned on the ramus so that the total ramus height will be restored when the condyle graft is mounted. Both the ramus and the condyle are cut at right angles so that the ramus is straight when the two are joined. The condyle must be correctly positioned in all planes. It helps to note the three-dimensional relationship of the condyle to the ramus prior to resecting it from the surgical specimen. The condyle is fixed to the graft with mini plates that avoid the articular surface. The overall ramus height has been restored and overall shape matches the template well. The graft compares well to an intact model of the specimen that's viewed from several angles. Here a model of the surgical specimen is superimposed over the graft. Both templates are used to plan the osteotomy in the mid-body. A mid-body osteotomy provides the necessary curve to the graft in the transverse plane. The inferior border of the body may curve upward, continue straight, or curve downward. The osteotomy must therefore allow for correct contour in two planes. After the osteotomy, the cut ends of the bones are adjusted and a mini plate placed. The shape is confirmed in each plane with the templates and then a second plate is placed along the inferior border of the graft. 
These plate holes are not used in order to prevent interference with placement of the lower plate screws. Graft shaping thus far is done with the graft attached at the donor site. Excess distal bone is not removed until the graft is inset. Prior to insetting the graft, the mandible is step cut as shown. Although this sacrifices several teeth, it provides additional gingival mucosa for a secure soft tissue closure. Next, the mandible is placed in intermaxillary fixation with arch bars. The final step in mandible preparation is to expose its inferior margin on the normal side as far as the mid-body. This facilitates matching the shape of the curve as the graft is inset. As the insetting begins, notice that the pedicle comes to lie in close proximity to where the neck vessels are. From below, not only must the curve be symmetric, but the angle must be equidistant from the mid-sagittal plane as the normal side. If not, the mandible will appear either bowed out or caved in. An osteotomy is needed in the distal body to provide additional curvature. A final osteotomy will remove the remainder of the bone. The graft is then fixed with mini plates in two planes. The transverse template is used constantly throughout the last part of the insetting process to make sure that the curve is symmetric. The angles are equidistant from the midline. Correct overall graft length is ensured by seating the condyle and then insetting the graft in the presence of intermaxillary fixation. An attempt is made to close the joint capsule around the condyle. Notice that the pedicle is ideally located for anastomosis to the cervical vessels. The lateral template confirms the accuracy of the reconstruction. After the anastomoses, the skin island is rotated into the oral cavity and wound closure begun. Two weeks after surgery, intermaxillary fixation is removed and the mandible mobilized. Anterior defects are a more challenging problem. These defects span the midline and usually involve differing amounts of the adjacent body segments. There is a greater chance for insetting errors, which may result in prognathism, retrognathia, increased or decreased lower facial height, or facial asymmetry if the graft is twisted. Because few teeth remain following resection, intermaxillary fixation is not possible. Insetting is less precise and more intuitive. It would seem logical to reconstruct such a defect in two parts joined at the midline as shown. In fact, it is more practical to do it in three parts with one central segment and two lateral segments. Like lateral reconstructions, the flap is designed so that the pedicle will lie at the angle of the mandible. Because this part of the body will not be replaced, the pedicle must be lengthened by this amount in order to reach without a vein graft. The anterior segment is usually made about two centimeters wide. Each of the three segments of the specimen are measured. As well as the additional pedicle length needed. Compared to a lateral graft, anterior grafts are designed more distally on the fibula in order to provide a longer pedicle. The striped segment corresponds to the intact mandible body that will not be replaced. Removing this segment of fibula will allow the pedicle to reach the angle. The three parts of the actual graft are seen to the right of this. This is the graft after a portion of the striped segment has been removed. This is normally done by subperiosteal dissection. Notice how the pedicle has been lengthened. The remaining striped portion will be removed as needed during graft insetting. The osteotomies on each end of the central segment are made to permit angulation in two planes. The transverse plane is more obvious, but the body must also angle upward in the lateral view. On the left, notice that the central segment is not parallel to the frontal plane, but appears rotated on its long axis. 
This is because there is angulation in only one plane where the central segment joins the body segments. On the right, the central segment is properly oriented because there is angulation in two planes. Proper central segment orientation is important not only to accurately duplicate normal mandible shape, but also to allow osseointegrated implants to be placed parallel to the maxillary arch at a later date. This shows what the cuts look like at each osteotomy site in order to provide angulation in two planes. The first mini plate is placed to fix the segments together. The angulation is checked with both the transverse template and the lateral template. A graft is shown after both osteotomies are complete. After a final confirmation of proper angulation with the templates, a mini plate is placed along the inferior border for increased rigidity against torsional stress. All graft shaping takes place with the flap attached at the donor site. As with lateral grafts, specimen measurements and the templates allow this to be done with great accuracy. At this point, the pedicle is divided and the flap transferred to the head for insetting. The graft will be inset so that the pedicle will come to lie at the angle of the mandible. Using the more distal fibula for the graft allows this to occur as illustrated here. Accurately insetting an anterior graft is difficult. The lateral segments are free to move in multiple planes. Errors of internal or external rotation, abduction, adduction, or a combination thereof can occur. The type of malposition can be different on each side. Despite this, external fixators have not proven necessary in order to avoid these potential problems. Other insetting errors include either angling the graft upward, which decreases lower facial height and interarch distance, or angling the graft downward, which is an error that has the opposite effect. It is also possible to make the graft too long, which results in prognathism. Or, the graft can be made too short, which results in retrognathia. These types of errors affect both facial aesthetics and future placement of osseointegrated implants. The only reliable landmarks during insetting are the maxillary arch, which guides the amount of anterior projection needed, and the midline, which helps prevent side-to-side -side asymmetries. After the final osteotomies are made on each end of the graft, mini plates are placed on both its outer and inferior surfaces to join it to the lateral mandible segments. Overall shape is confirmed with both the transverse template and the lateral template. Accurate graft shaping and insetting restores mandible shape and function. After the bony reconstruction is complete, the microvascular anastomoses and soft tissue closure are performed. Most anterior defects require a skin island to resurface the floor of the mouth. This drawing illustrates flap design for a right hemimandible reconstruction. The ipsilateral leg is preferred based on the three-dimensional relationship of the fibula to the skin island and flexor hallucis longus muscle. For true anterior defects, either side can be used, but the side with the longer mandible body defect is usually preferred. The graft is initially osteotomized on either end, leaving about four centimeters of bone proximally and six distally. Additional distal bone will ultimately be discarded. The angle of the mandible graft is planned where the pedicle enters the bone. This maximizes pedicle length. As shown before, this becomes the mandible body and this the mandible ramus. The contralateral leg is used when the vessels ipsilateral to the defect are not available. This drawing illustrates how the right leg would be used for a left hemimandible defect in such a situation. This design option effectively lengthens the pedicle to reach the opposite side of the neck 
and eliminates the need for vein grafts. The initial osteotomies are made proximally and distally while raising the flap. This portion of the bone is then removed in a subperiosteal plane. Preservation of the soft tissue surrounding it effectively lengthens the pedicle so that the vessels will comfortably reach the opposite side of the neck. This becomes the mandible body with the angle here and the ramus here. The skin island design shown in black will provide adequate soft tissue and still allow wound closure without a skin graft. The skin island is centered over the posterior border of the bone to include all septal perforators. It is no more than four centimeters in greatest width. The entire length of the septum is included with the flap regardless of bone length requirements. This will maximize skin blood supply, which is reliable in 91% of cases. This skin design is useful for those anterior defects which require skin both in the oral cavity and externally. The design is tapered proximally and distally to include all septal perforators. A skin graft closure of the leg is necessary. This portion of the skin will be used intraorally, this part deepithelialized for insetting the lip, and this part used externally. This patient is shown five years after fibular reconstruction of the right hemimandible. The ossifying fibroma did not involve the mucosa. The condyle was transplanted in this patient. Interincisal opening is 50 millimeters. This panorex taken three years after surgery shows bony union at all osteotomy sites and reasonably good symmetry of the inferior border of the mandible. This patient is an ideal candidate for placement of osseointegrated implants. This patient is shown three years after reconstruction of the right hemimandible. The small mucosal defect associated with the mucoepidermoid carcinoma of bone did not require skin island replacement. Condyle transplantation was performed. Interincisal opening is 39 millimeters. The postoperative panorex is shown. This patient is shown two years after reconstruction of the left hemimandible. The small mucosal defect associated with the mucoepidermoid carcinoma of bone did not require skin island replacement. Condyle transplantation was performed. Interincisal opening is 50 millimeters. The postoperative panorex shows early bone formation. This is a tomogram of the two-year-old condyle graft in this patient. Note that there is bony union with the fibula graft and that the condyle has not resorbed. This patient is shown two years after reconstruction of the left hemimandible. He also had a mucoepidermoid carcinoma of bone that did not require a skin island. Condyle transplantation was performed. Interincisal opening is 45 millimeters. An early postoperative panorex is shown. This patient is shown one year after reconstruction of the anterior mandible. A skin island was needed for this anterior floor of mouth epidermoid carcinoma. Interincisal opening is more limited in this patient despite the presence of two normal condyles. The fibula skin island has replaced the missing floor of mouth mucosa. An early postoperative panorex is shown. Patients with anterior grafts such as this have the most to gain from dental reconstruction utilizing osseointegrated implants. A preliminary procedure is necessary prior to implant placement in order to remove some of the mini plates. This is the panorex of a patient with a similar defect 
in whom osseointegrated implants were placed after mini plate removal. Note that the fibula has adequate height to accommodate these 10 millimeter long implants. In conclusion, lateral and anterior defects are different three-dimensional problems. Each requires a specific approach in order to achieve an accurate reconstruction. From an aesthetic point of view, the most important goal is to accurately reconstruct the contour of the inferior border of the mandible. The surgical specimen is a key reference for both measurements and shape. Templates are essential for allowing the graft to be shaped while still attached at the donor site and to assist insetting of the graft later. Mini plates are an ideal method of fixation. They are strong, easy to use, not bulky, and facilitate the graft shaping process as it proceeds from segment to segment. For lateral defects, Condyle transplantation is useful in the case where high ramus transection is necessary. The leg ipsilateral to the defect is the preferred fibula donor, except when the vessels on the opposite side of the neck must be used. When the skin island is properly designed with respect to septocutaneous blood supply, it is reliable in at least 91% of patients.